Um, I want to welcome Kelly Grayson to the show. He has been a paramedic for, I guess, about 24 years now. Is that right? Uh, 20, no, 30. 30 years now. 30. He's been 31 uh, years in, in EMS, and uh, this is my 30th as a paramedic. Awesome. He's been a field paramedic, critical care transport paramedic, field supervisor. He does a ton of education stuff. Um, he frequently speaks at EMS conferences. Um, he's got a really popular blog called A Day in the Life of an Ambulance Driver. Um, and then he's written a few books that I've read as well. Um, one, I think you published, I, I guess they were both last year, um, In Route, which is a paramedic stories of life, death, and everything in between. And then On Scene, uh, more stories of life, death, and everything in between. Um, and I just finished reading that one. And you've got some like really profound stuff in there that I don't want to gloss over. So I, I kind of wanted to talk about that book today, if you don't mind. Um, there's some lessons in there that I think are just crucial for um, paramedics and EMTs to kind of learn. And sometimes it takes them years to learn this stuff. Yes. Um, yes. And just so you know, my goal with this podcast is basically to help emergency medicine folks not feel so alone in the things that we see, the things that we deal with. Um, and help them not just survive working in emergency medicine, whether it's in EMS or in the hospital, um, but to thrive in emergency medicine and actually be able to sustain their careers long term without burning out and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's kind of the framework that I have these conversations from. Um, can we start by talking about paramedic cockiness? Yeah, well, I, I, uh, I was, uh, if you look under cocky, paramedic in the dictionary, you'll see my smiling face. Um, I, I was that paramedic. I firmly believe that, that EMS, uh, EMS classes graduate one of two kinds of paramedics. There's the kind who are scared of their own shadow. They're, they're intimidated by the responsibility they now have and the, the power they have. And they spend the first year or two of their career carrying their textbooks around with them and obsessively reading and reminding themselves and then there's the other kind who thinks they are God's gift to EMS and, and they're going to save lives and stamp out disease and pestilence and thwart the reaper at every turn. If only was someone would have the damn common courtesy to code on their shift. Um, <laughs> and I was that guy. I was that guy. I, I think you have to have a certain degree of cockiness uh, and, and self-confidence to work autonomously like we do as paramedic. 100%. Be overdone. And uh, I think I... I think I overdid it in the first part of my career. That's basically what in route was. Um, I wrote that book 14, 15 years ago um, and and just re-released it uh, uh, when the publishing rights from my former publisher uh, lapsed. Um, okay. I got to, I re-released it the way it was intended to be instead of the way they butchered it. Okay, I think I read it years ago because I was confused because I saw the new publication date. I was like, I swear I read this book years ago. It's called Life, Death, and Everything in Between. I think the oh, only okay. thing that, uh, that Kaplan Press did right with it was uh, give it a better title. Gotcha. And, and that, that, that book was en route. And it was written at a time in my career where I was going through some personal turmoil and everything. And I just wanted to reconnect with, uh, with a part of my career where I thought I knew all the answers. So that's what became en route the first 10 or so years of my paramedic career where I was, uh, had the answers to everything and I was God's gift to paramedicine. Yeah. I think a lot of us went through that when we were brand new. I mean, it's, you make a great point in the book about like sometimes in order to have that like self-confidence and decisiveness, it kind of comes with a level of cockiness. And I think that's so true. I think you kind of get those qualities all mixed in together and certain of us may, maybe some of us get humbled a little bit quicker than others and, yeah. um, kind of understand that. But I think, paramedics have to deal with this chaos and create order of it. And they have to come up with a plan, even if we don't know exactly what to do and you've yeah. got to come up with a plan and stick to it. And I think that means you've got to have a little bit of a level of cockiness sometimes in order to have that confidence and, and figure out a plan. So I think that's a great point that not a lot of people realize. And I think if you know, it's there, you kind of know you have some cockiness, then you actually can temper it with, you know, with some better qualities, I think if you know it's there, but. Yeah, there's there's no substitute for being self-aware. When you look at yourself and go, Jesus, I, I really am full of myself. You can start to dial it back a little bit, but, right. um, you know, that that uh, that old saying, you know, uh, uh, where the paramedic goes to heaven and and um, he sees this guy walking around and he's carrying a pager and a, and a Batman utility 
Ripley belt and the life pack 15 slung over his shoulder. And I said, who is that? And he said, Oh, that's God. He likes to play paramedics sometimes. <laughs> I, uh, I was, I was honestly, I was probably that guy. And I think all paramedics or all the cocky paramedics are that way until they run their first DWPA call. And then that changes things. Um, and I, I had that DWPA call and, uh, that kind of call um, can either make you or break you. And I think it made me, it, it made mm -hmm. me endeavor to be worthy of my cockiness and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, let my skills and knowledge try to catch up with my ego. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at one point in the book, you tell a really moving story about an elderly, elderly woman whom you were pretty familiar with. And she'd basically given up on life shortly after her husband, who I think you also responded on had passed. Um, and I think this is a patient we all see from time to time and like, we want to help them so bad. Like we want to do all these things for them. And, you know, like in, in my side as a PA in the ER, we want to admit this patient. We want to do this huge workup and give them a ton of IV fluids and make them eat food. And it, it raises a good point that not every patient wants to be saved. And that's something we see a lot too. Um, how do you tackle that patient that doesn't want to be saved? I, you know, I, I, once upon a time, I was probably, I was very conservative and, and I thought, you know, um, try to save everyone and, and suicide is a horrible thing and, and a sin against God. And it may be, but that's not for me to decide. And for some people, uh, you come to realize after you've had so many quote unquote saves that uh, wound up uh, like a vegetable, you just, uh, a houseplant, you turn them in water them every couple of hours that's not living, that's existing. And that's not a save. That's not a victory. Mm -hmm. And for some people, quite a few people, um, death is a mercy. And, and I think, uh, I think that lady, um, I won't say her name, but she's still very vivid in my head. One of the things about working EMS in a small town is, you know, everybody and, and yeah. the people you work on are, are friends and neighbors. And yes, I had worked on her, uh, and I'd worked on her husband. Uh, I called, called him when, when she found him in dead, uh, dead in bed next to her the, uh, one morning and she was just tired and wanted to go. Um, I don't know if I was going to affect that, but what I was going to do was try to draw her out and at least, uh, let defeat and resignation not be the last thing she thought of before she passed and got yeah. her, you know, coax a smile out of her and, and got her to talking, which, to my mind is a, is a victory. Sometimes the only thing you can do good for the patient is to smile and hold their hand and, uh, and talk with them, let them know somebody, somebody cares. Absolutely. Yeah. I think those kinds of things are things we overlook too much in EMS. And I think paramedics as a culture, we look at the innovations and the cardio versions and all these cool skills that we get to perform. And then you forget that sometimes it's these small moments with the patients that actually keep you doing this much longer than all the innovations or high level skills in the world. You know, it's actually the meaningful moments. Yeah. All the, all the things that we think are cool don't matter to patients. You know, I can fall down a flight of stairs and accidentally intubate five people on the way down. Patients don't care. Um, mm -hmm. I can be the ACLS wizard and, and run a code as smooth as, as glass. Patients don't care. What do they care about? Did the ambulance get there in a hurry? Was the ride smooth? And was the crew nice? Mm -hmm. And when you start realizing that, then you realize when you realize that's what's important to people, um, then your perspective changes and, and you, you start to incorporate customer service and kindness and empathy into your skill repertoire. You know, a good paramedic uh, has all the skills and all the knowledge, but a great paramedic gives the biggest gift and that's empathy. And, and I, I, I strive to be a great paramedic. I don't achieve it every single day. Um, but there are those times when, you know, that's, that's the best you can do for a patient. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's this one story in the book that is absolutely crazy where one of your EMT partners, and I guess you guys had to, had to do this multiple times, but you rescue a boy from a river you know, after it sounds like he, he had probably drowned, you know, well before you got there. Um, and it brings up a point about how we just don't have happy endings all the time. And a lot of our emergent calls are not going to have this ending that you see in the movies. And, uh, you know, the parents being re re reunited with their kids and then coming back to life and 
Um, how do we handle those calls, I guess, that don't have the happy endings like they're often portrayed? I, I think the, the best thing you can do is your best. Um, and the ending is not necessarily up to you. And you forgive yourself if you didn't, if you, I don't know if you could even call it a failure. Uh, you, if you did the best you can, I don't think that's a failure at all. But we, we often think that, that it is if we didn't save someone, um, when, you know, the, the biggest thing we can offer is, is, uh, our caring. And, uh, in that case, Bodie, uh, that was, that was written. That was an amalgam of two calls. Uh, and both of which he was on. And uh, my partner, Bodie Glennon, was he was the 2002 National EMT of the year. And uh, he had, on a couple of those occasions, just done something exceedingly foolhardy and stupid that he would do again and again because he just can't, you know, as he said said to me, you know, Boogan, I, I can't do, I can't not do that and not be able to shave the face I see in the morning. And, uh, and I say, you know, I, I can't, I can't be less than what my daddy taught me to be. And, you know, mm -hmm. and a, that was pretty resonant for me. And, you know, uh, he said that to me when I was cussing him out after that call, I said, you stupid so-and-so, what do you, I'm going to be the the one that calls Paula and tells her that her husband died and I could have stopped it. I'm going to, I'm going to be the one to have to look at your kids, uh, when your wife is struggling after you're gone, how dare you do that? And he said, they'd understand cause my wife married me, uh, uh, the man I am and I can't be otherwise. And I said, okay, I can, I can understand that. I think that's one of those things where, you know, in EMS, I, I think there's, everyone needs to realize that there is a, there is a not insignificant chance that you may, when you put on your uniform and leave every morning that you may not come home. Um, it's, it's a small chance, but it is there. And you either reconcile that or you don't stay in the, in the career long. Uh, those 343 people that went up in the Twin Towers on 9-11 probably knew what they were going into and that there was a very good chance they would not come out. But you can't be otherwise. And, and I think that's something that uh, each EMT has to reconcile with themselves. See when that, uh, are, are they going to rise to that moment if or when it ever happens. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, one thing that comes up on the podcast, I feel like fairly regularly is the difficulty we all have taking care of that drunk driver or the perpetrator of that crime, um, that's responsible for killing other people. And maybe we, we even care for in the ER, maybe we're, we're taking care of that perpetrator of a crime. We're taking care of the innocent victims. We're taking care of, um, somebody that maybe dies on scene or, or dies, you know, when they arrive at the hospital, um, sometimes the, the conversation devolves into all the thoughts that go through our head. And, you know, obviously we're doing the best for these patients, just like they were any other patient. And often in the ER, we don't even know the whole story, you know? So our care doesn't of course differ regardless of what, what happened on the scene prior to, but, um, you describe it really well in the book as this like acid that's in your mind and how you strive to not bring that acid home to your family. But sometimes it's just too much to bear, and that acid spills over into your family. And I think that's a good analogy of what we all experience with these because you can't really articulate it very well to your family. And it's, but it is an acid in your mind and it's something that you can let spill over to your family. And a lot of us do from time to time because I think if you hold it in, that can be a problem too. Um, how do we deal with kind of that acid of dealing with those types of situations and, and how can our families help us with that, I guess? Yeah. You know, I, that story was was one that was omitted from the original version of En Route um, because the publisher thought it was too dark and and that uh, she didn't want to give people a uh, or the publisher didn't want to give people a, a negative image of EMTs. But I thought that it was very raw and real and and that's how most of us think. Uh, we've all had that that dark old devil on your shoulder whispering things to you like, "Why does this person deserve to live after what they've done?" Um, and, and I didn't succumb to that. Uh, we all have to fight that battle. I, personally, I, I think that I'm going to steal a line from someone else. And I can't remember where I heard this from, but, but it has stuck with me ever since. He said, um, this person said that in EMS, we deal with all the grief and pain and, and horror and violence. Man visits upon his fellow man. And we, we take all those feelings and we stuff it out of sight 
in a box. We, we stick it in a box so we can do our jobs and remain, uh, remain rational and, and remain objective. We stick it out of, uh, in that box and then we slide the box under the bed and we make jokes about the existence of the box. And that's what dark humor is and, and, yeah. and all that. But the thing is, is, is what's in that box festers. And if you do not empty it out sometimes, um, it's going to, it's going to overflow and it's going to stain everything that it touches. And the question is, how do we empty out the box? I think you have to have family, uh, a wife and children, a support system that even though you don't want to share that stuff with them, you have to, you have to know where, uh, they have to be willing to at least hear some of it. Um, you may sanitize a little bit, but just the fact that you have someone who wants to listen and who doesn't judge you, because God, we are our own worst judges. Uh, if you someone that holds you to not so strict a standard and loves you despite what you think you may have failed, that's that's all important. Um, and your friends, you know, your friends in EMS are, are vital in that as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all too often when we get away from work, it becomes a bitch session about the dispatcher we hate or the supervisor we don't like or that other crew who never seems to do their job and we're always picking up their slack. But if you can get away and just stop bitching about work and just be there for, for each other, that's invaluable. I call it beer and nachos therapy. And and the, the healing is not in the hops and the, and the, the nacho cheese. It's the it's the the feeling that someone understands and you can unburden yourself and no one's going to judge. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you just have to air the box out like uh, grief and, and trauma are kind of like cockroaches uh, shine a light on them and they scatter. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it, it goes away. If you, you know, I, I'm, I'm long winded about this. I used to have a patient you may have read this in a book. One of my first, my, my first DWPA call was a young man that I thought I was going to, uh, you know, I thought I had all the answers and, and I was in no way prepared for how sick he was and didn't ask for help when I should have. And he wound up dying despite, I didn't kill him, but I damn sure didn't do him any good. And uh, I had, I still remember his name. I remember his demographics and his birthday. And I used to have nightmares about that kid trying to secure an airway and trying to suction the blood out of his mouth um, I would wake up uh, multiple times a year for 10 or 15 years. And I started telling that story in some of my keynote speeches at EMS conferences and um, hadn't had that nightmare since. So the, the analogy I use is that every good paramedic or doctor or nurse or, or professional caregiver, we all have our own psychic graveyard uh, of all and, and all the headstones in that graveyard are people that we think we fail, not necessarily people that died because dying happens uh, despite the best of our efforts, but the people that we didn't meet our own standards, we didn't uh, uphold our own standards. We think we failed them, uh, and those aims are etched in your memory, and they're never ever going to go away. But what you can do is learn to make friends with the ghosts, and that's what I did. I think that's a great point. I mean, it's something so simple. Maybe a lot of us just don't do it. You don't tell the story of that call. You don't talk to anybody about it. You think that you can handle it on your own. And something so simple is just explaining what you're struggling with to somebody I think does relieve that burden. I mean, yeah, we're going to, we're not going to forget those calls. They're going to come up from time to time, but I think that's a great point that just telling somebody what you're struggling with can work a lot more wonders maybe than we think it can. Yeah. You know, the family and patients and, and all those people are, will forgive us far more readily than we forgive ourselves. Sure. It's, it's, it's kind of odd that way, but we blame ourselves a lot more than they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another quote from your book that I wanted to bring up, um, with a career of any length in emergency medicine, or sorry, with a career of any length in EMS comes a certain measure of psychologic protection against the brutality man can visit on his brother. You do what you can, you move on. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, except when it's a child. Um, and this is something that we come, we talk about a fair amount on this, on this podcast as well. Cause these are the calls that people struggle with a lot as well. Um, we kind of talked about this, I guess a little bit, but what other strategies do you have to kind of heal from the, the toughest of calls, which are these pediatric calls? Um, Peds calls are tough and they're tough for every healthcare provider. You, you take, 
any practice survey and they'll tell you, you know, what is the, the, the call that stress you out the most. And if it's not working on a family member or a coworker, it's a pediatric arrest or, or mm -hmm. some peds call. I think the reason for that is, is, is when, when you code a 78 year old little old lady, um, you know that she's, she's had her family, she's had her kids and her grandkids. She's lived her life, uh, you know, and her body is, is at the end of its, of its, you know, the maintenance, uh, the warranty is run out and, and all the systems are starting to fail. And even if you do get them back, quite often, you're not saving a, a heart that's too good to die. You're saving a body that's too sick to live. So you can rationalize that a little bit. You know, it's not that big of a tragedy. You can tell yourself that death is a mercy in many, many cases. Not so with a kid. Uh, and I have, I still have trouble reconciling that. And the only way I can, I don't know that you can reconcile it. I don't know you can, if you can um, ever forget or put aside the, the sense of loss. You know, someone that had, instead of the 75 years behind them, they have 75 years in front of them. It's never going to happen. They're not going to have a family. The kids they might have had, the career they might have had, none of that's going to happen. And it's such a loss to to society uh, in general that that it's it's hard to reconcile. I don't know that I know how. What I do know is that as much as my girlfriend and I may argue, and much she may nag at me, as much as I may sit sullenly in front of the TV and not talk to her, when I have that call, I can come home and crawl into bed and cry on her shoulder. And the next morning it's going to be okay. I, I may still remember it, but but I can let it out and I can grieve um, with no repercussions. And you know, I've I've had a call. Uh, I had a call like that. One that stands out in my mind is uh, we had a a pediatric trauma arrest. Uh, a father-in-law or a, a stepfather backed over his 18-month-old son mm -hmm. and killed him. And our, you know, we're sent there code three. I, I read the notes. I know what's going to happen. This is cardiac arrest. The police are, you know, a car back over this child. He's not going to come back. 20 minutes it took us to get to the scene. If he was going to come back, he would have come back long before we got there. And when we arrived, there's this, this sheriff's deputy desperately doing chest compressions. And the child is obviously dead. Uh, on the way to the call, I called medical control. Uh, the nearest hospital that we would be transporting to. And I said, I want your permission, got the doctor on the phone. So I want your permission to call this without having to pick up the phone and call you if it is what I think it is. He said, well, you, you're asking me to let you call a, a resuscitation before you've seen the baby. And I said, if it's what I think it is, the parents are going to be my patients. And the last thing I need to do is say, hold on a second, let me get on the phone. Um, and arrived on the scene. It was what I thought it was. And I gently pulled the cop away. And I mean, his hands were still locked together. And he's still, you know, shell-shocked. And after the call, uh, I sit and, and look across the hood of my truck at, at my partner and five sheriff's deputies. And they were all just wrecked. And I asked one of them, I said, uh, you going to be okay? He said, no, but I'll drown it. And I said, man, um, not for nothing, guys. And I'm not, I'm not your priest or your confessor or your therapist, but sometimes you just can't do anything and booze is not going to solve it. Sometimes you got to learn to forgive yourself. And everything that you did here today was in keeping with the highest honor of your profession. And you did what you could. Sometimes you can't save them and don't beat yourself up about it because you did everything perfectly right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that mattered, but I, I think they needed this. Uh, I think the reason they did CPR was so they could, they knew, but so they could say they did something. And, uh, you know, um, going home and drowning it in a, in a, a fifth of, of McAllen is probably not the best choice. Uh, it's a tasty choice, but it's not the best one. You go home and, yeah. and you do your weeping and, uh, you know, you go hug your kids and, you know, that's why you do it. I'll, yeah. I'll add one thing to this. This is this, uh, the uh, Mike Smith, a uh, very esteemed EMS educator from Tacoma, Washington, uh, said one time that, that patients and partners and supervisors and all these 
uh, are debtors in your emotional bank account. They, all of them, dealing with your partners and your patients and, and your supervisors and the people at work, those are, they make withdrawals from your emotional bank account. If you don't make some deposits on a regular basis, you're going to wind up emotionally bankrupt. So you go yeah. do the things, the life affirming things that, that, that give you joy and uh, add some stuff to that personal bank account for, for the time when, uh, so you still have some buffer against those withdrawals. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a good analogy. I like that. And go go have the couple of drinks on a day that on a good day, not on a bad day, I guess. So it's a not a bad coping strategy. It's something you do for for fun and not to not to cope. So we all know the people that have taken that to the extreme, and that's just such a hard vice, especially in our yeah. profession. Yes, it is.